See, I like the fact that God allows us to walk in the light. To be something different than what the world throws at us. To, to be something different than what, what we expected to happen. John chapter 16, we look, we're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. And do you know that, that God sent His Holy Spirit that we might have things differently? That not only in, in the Gospel of John He proclaimed that message, but all through the Bible He, he affirms that there's a promise and a power that the Holy Spirit brings that makes a difference in our lives. Understanding and embracing the promise and the power of this Holy Spirit changes everything. I wonder if you're if if you are, if I am, if I'm trying to get the the idea, the concept, the 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 belief that that things make a difference, maybe maybe we should start at the basics of basics. Do you know there's a there's a difference between our perception and of the way things are and the way things are. Did you know? Did you know that sometimes our perception can be skewed by not only the circumstances of our upbringing, but the circumstances that we see in our world today. It can change the way we see things. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about the difference between, and, and this is something I shouldn't I shouldn't admit this to you. Is it okay for a pastor to admit something that he's been working on for probably 10 years? Honestly, I've been working on this one particular thing for 10 years. And it's a thing that I, I believe that I'll have to work on the rest of my life. But it's so shaped the way I look at things, I think it's valuable for you today. I've, I've been trying for 10 years to become an observer instead of a judge. To make observations instead of judgments. Now judgments would tell me uh, if something's good or bad, right or wrong, good or evil. And I can, I can judge that. The problem is I began to let that overflow into other areas of my life. And I become judgmental about, well, about pretty much everything. Or I can make an observation. I, I, I jotted something down. I want you to think about it this way. I, I, I jotted down that, you know, uh, the difference between a, uh, an observation might be the color of the carpet. A judgment might be whether I like the carpet or not. Kind of like a song. I can judge the, the song based on rhythm or, or style of music or, or, or a lot of things. Or I can observe the song and let it speak to me. Do you know the songs that I don't even like as far as the... The, the lyrical arrangement or, 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 or any of those things, sometimes they'll speak to me. It's kind of weird. Music's that way. I was also thinking about, you know, judgment requires... Uh, oh, I, was, I had one more. One more. Uh, an observation is when I, I look at the news and, and I'm trying to figure out why would they say what they say? Instead of saying, that person's a liar. Maybe because they've lied before. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but in that moment, why are they saying what they would say? Do you know that a lot of our news today is not shaped by what's, what's actually an event in the world? But it's a way to shape your thought process. It's a way to make you look at things a particular way. Is there no doubt? Is there no common sense that would tell us? Why would you announce a, a SCOTUS, a uh, Supreme Court pick on the day that Russia is having all these things and the news is consumed. A little better yet, why would you do it on a Friday? Because <laughs> the news outlets are closed. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> these people aren't stupid. They might be evil, but they're not stupid. So the process in here is I've got to be a person that observes and says, well, why are they saying what they say? And then, here's the hard part, and then I've got to take it at face value. Because there are lots of times, lots of times when things are reported on the news and I know different working in the medical field for all those years. And they reported a particular way and you knew that it wasn't, it wasn't that way. So the observation needs to prompt in me, not a judgment. Make sense? So I wrote it down this way. Judgment requires me to be right. Observation leaves room for me to be guided and to be grown by the Holy Spirit. 
Judgment builds walls. Observation builds futures. I want to be a person that builds a future. A future for me, a future for those around me. That, and I often wondered, and you can laugh if you want, it's true, and I laughed when she said it, but one of our daughters said that I'm going to be the grumpy old guy that walks down the street in a trench coat. And I told her, the joke's on you, I already do that. <laughs> but I have noticed, in, as I get older, it's, it's hard not to be shaped by the things I've endured. It's hard not to be shaped by the things I've had to encounter over life. It's hard. And I wondered about people who were older and why they were so cynical. Why they, why they had all those walls. Some of them to protect themselves. And, and here, here's the hard part. Some of them rightly built because they suffered horrible things. But in that, how do I be that person that goes to my Father in Heaven in a continual growth process. I think you have to be an observer to do that. I think you have to be somebody that's willing to grow and willing to change. In these Scriptures, very few Scripture here, um, God points out in, in a clear way what it means, but also the steps that have to be taken. And, and the hardships that will happen. You know, it's funny, but uh, I equate it to getting out of bed in the dark. You ever get out of bed in the dark and you kind of make your way through the house and everything's good? You know what happens if somebody moves that chair? Or that ottoman? Or that nightlight? You start talking to Jesus. In a kind way. I hope. Sort of, hopefully. I mean, eventually it gets there in the kind way. But you start talking to Jesus. And it's amazing how that little toe can hurt so much. In, in Scripture, sometimes we forget that sorrow was a real commodity. These pages are not written for some kind of vacuum where things bad, that bad things didn't happen. And they're not written to people who live in a world today where bad things don't happen. Bad things happen. A lot. You look at verse 5, and this is also a sidebar, but if you're going to be an observer, you can't look in a narrow way. If you're really going to be an observer, it's really important to have a broad view of things. Verse 5. But now I go away to Him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Simple question, right? And you get the concept that maybe, maybe Jesus is just saying that because it's over their head. Maybe He's just saying that because they're not, they're not grasping the gravity of the moment. Well, look at back at verse 1, chapter 16. And it gives us an insight of why they're saying what they're saying. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Jesus is telling them point blank. There's bad stuff's happening. Well, how bad is this stuff that's happening? Verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that, they, that he offers God service. Now wait a minute. Hold on. If I believe this Jesus guy and he's really a Messiah, he's coming to save the world, and he all, he's all knowing, all empowering, all, all everything. I'm not sure I hear anything in the conversation past when he tells me people are going to kill me. I would have been, I would have been a little concerned when he said they're going to kick me out of church. But when he tells me they're going to kill me and they're going to feel justified about it, I'm a little distracted after that. I don't hear much after that. You know, it's really hard. And please hear this. It's really hard to hear and sense the Holy Spirit, even as powerful as it is, when the world's overwhelming to me. It's hard. It's, it's almost impossible. Verse 3. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father and me. Now wait a minute. So the people that are going to kill me who are in the church, in the synagogue, don't know Jesus. And you thought our world was messed up. Wait a minute, that is our world. Anyway, if I'm going to be an observer and try to figure out, okay, what's the difference, not just make a judgment call about how bad these people are and how horrible they are, and, and even a judgment about Jesus and why did He lead me down this path that's going to get me killed. Verse 4. 
But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. See, the powerful point here is Jesus gives us the information that we need at the moment for the event or the occurrence at the time, right? And if we're not observers and paying attention, we will get the idea that when we've learned something. You ever get the idea you've learned something? That you don't get it's just me that does that? I get the idea every once in a while I got past something, and then it comes back to me later. And and I've noticed that when I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I'm hurting, I'm so vulnerable to the things that drag me down. Aren't we all? See, he says here in verse 5, sorrow can lead to asking or not asking the right questions. But now I go away to Him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? See, doesn't that one little verse read differently now? They, they didn't ask any. They didn't ask the right questions. And, and, and they weren't they weren't observant of what was taking place. They were caught up in the moment. And, and honestly, rightfully so. I'm not throwing rocks at them. Rightfully so. And also, though, in verse 6 it says, sorrow can be overwhelming. It, it can consume your heart. It can bring you to such a level where nothing else is visible. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, now, when, when something's full of something, there's no room for anything else, right? Now, there's a difference than being sorrowful. There's a difference than, than, than having sorrow. I think having sorrow and being, being humble and, and hurting for and having empathy for others is a great thing. But if sorrow fills your heart and there's no room for anything else, you're in jeopardy. Sorrow is not to consume our heart. We are to see and to sense and to embrace the fact that no matter what the circumstances of this day tell me, my God is alive and well. And He loves me. He loves you immensely. And I, and I need that reminder. We, we need that reminder to know that, that, that sorrow is real, but, but the Spirit is, is responsive and it's going gonna, it's gonna to respond in those moments when things are necessary. And when I need that deeply, when you need that deeply, and, and every once in a while he'll respond when I don't necessarily need it deeply. I'm just not paying attention. Like the disciples. Verse 7. See, the difficult part is we can be consumed with sorrow. And, and please hear this. Sorrow does not change the truth. Sometimes I can be filled with sorrow and and, and it's real and it's it's impactful, just like this. Sometimes I can be filled with sorrow, and it's 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 about how self self generated. I, I can have um, I don't know what you call them, but I always call them pity parties. I can get consumed with with all the bad, and and I'm not saying there isn't bad. I'm I'm not saying that, but if I get consumed with the bad and I get full of the bad, it's hard to see the good. Verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, that if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. See, there was a, nece there was a necessary part of walking through this very sorrowful time. And it, it, it had to usher in the time where Jesus went back to, his, to the Heavenly Father and He sent this thing called a Helper. He sent this thing called a Holy Spirit. He, he sent this person, this indwelling person, process of Christ that would dwell in you as a child of His. Do you know why that's important? Well, I'll just tell you. You can't survive without it. That's just the way it is. Left to my own demise, I would be not only that guy who mumbled and muttered, and, and I always pictured him not just with a trench coat, but with a little derby hat. Uh, walking down, talking to himself. I'd be that guy, but but I'd be so much worse. 
I want you to know that sorrow does happen, but a Savior, a Savior leads. A Savior loves. And He, he never leaves us, no matter what the circumstances are telling us at the moment. The second thing is that the Spirit comes, but, but separation convicts. Give me a chance to explain this, but look, look at verse 8. And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Me. Of righteousness because I go to, the, to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. In the process, He's saying, first of all, that this separation of this this reason that Jesus is going back allows the Holy Spirit to come in and that He's going to convict. He's going to reprove, some Bibles might say. He's going to, he's going to admonish or convince. And, and every, every once in a while, I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm, I'm going to dive in there anyway. Every once in a while, growing up and, and through life, I thought, I thought it was important to stand up for truth. It's valuable to stand up in truth. It's important to make sure that people understand truth. Unless truth causes separation. Wayne, what do you mean? Hardest part of marriage. Hardest part of marriage by far. Not to point out truth. All the time. When you see it. What are you laughing? So you're you're laughing like you're half you're half laughing because it's true, and you're laughing because you're scared. <laughs> See, sometimes, sometimes God leads one or the other of you in a marriage to a point, and He's dra drawing the other person there, and they're not there yet. How do you give God's grace to the other person without calling causing separation? I know of someone who, who felt called to, to pastor. And their spouse had said, no way. Not a chance. Won't consider it. Made a judgment call. Didn't observe. See, it's hard to see the leading of God in someone that we have seen be so treacherous before. Make mistakes have problems, have issues. And I think a, a part of what God places in us men is to try to do it right. To try to lead. To try to love. And when you mess it all up, it's hard to say to someone that you care deeply about, God's leading us to do it this way. And not try to force it. Not cause division. See, the only, the only conviction that should fall here is are we following what the Holy Spirit leads? And are we giving God's grace to get everybody on that page? And here's the good part. Once we get on the page, once we, once we follow God's timing, let's march on. Because you can't stagnate. You can't stumble. You can't, you can't stand still for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. You know one of the funny things about the Holy Spirit? He's alive and well and moving. He's not sitting in some rocket chair waiting for Wayne to make a decision. He's not waiting for the world to get better. He's not waiting for everything to get fixed. See, there's this problem. It's the same recurring problem since the Garden of Eden. You see it there in verse 9? He says, well, let me read verse 8 again. And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Me. See, when there are certain offenses that God will turn a loving, compassionate, gracious hand toward. When you decide not to follow God, to violate the law of God, 
when you choose not to stand with God, you don't get any of the rest of the perks. Just the way it is. I didn't set up the, the plan. I didn't set up the process. But God says that's the way it is. And I hear a lot of people say, oh, I prayed to God for this and I prayed to God for that. And you ask them, you talk to them, you, you say, well, tell me about the time you met Jesus for, for the first time. And they're like, well, I, I never really, I don't really believe that way. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but that little prayer that you said did just like some of my emails. It disappeared. Because God wants your heart. He wants a relationship. And for you to have a wish list of what God can do for you and not be willing to surrender to Him doesn't work. And the Holy Spirit is here to guide us and to make sure that, well, maybe more me than you, but to make sure some of us who are a little, um, what's that word? Self-consumed. Have an eye for those who are hurting. Have an understanding of what's right and wrong, no matter. Because I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of keeping track of this. We can talk over my list sometime if you ever want to know about it. But there, my list is growing of the things that the government says is okay, that are legal, that are immoral, that are against God's law. That the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit I believe, convicts me and I believe everyone else not to stand for or stand with. There's got to be that conviction of, of sin, of walking away, of violating God's law, of rejecting Jesus. You're like, well, I'm not rejecting Jesus. Well, to be honest, you are. If God says walk down this path with this person that you don't like, and you don't walk down that path, you just rejected Jesus. Let me give you another one. If you're driving down the road and you're praying and thinking and you're in the right frame of mind and you're, you're lifting up God, maybe you're singing praise songs, or maybe you're just sitting there quietly. And God says, call this person. Love on this person. Minister to this person. And you don't do it. You just rejected Jesus. That's your choice. But that's the fact. I think the church would operate differently. I think our world would be different if people simply responded when the Holy Spirit convicted. We wouldn't do a lot of the things that get us in trouble and we'd do a lot of the things that we should that we're not doing. He says of sin, but he also says of righteousness. I mean, of uh, yeah, of righteousness. Verse ten of righteousness, you're convicted by the Holy Spirit because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Now wait a minute, how can I be convicted when God's Son is going away? How does that work? See, he's saying that you're not acceptance in the fact that when He goes away, when He went away, let's backtrack for just a minute. Why did He come? To save the world. To, to stand before man and say, this is the greatest gift in the world. When he, when he had finished that task and he went away, why did he need to go? So the Holy Spirit might come and dwell in you. If, if you stand in your own righteousness and feel like you don't need the conviction or guidance or wisdom of the, of the Holy Spirit, God's going to say, go with it. You ever, been, you ever been right? Knew you were right? Just, just, just knew that you were right? Don't only find out later you are wrong? I mean, it's only me. I've done that before. I've been like, no, 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 this is right. This is, this is, it can't be another way. There's no way that can be another way. Turned out later it was a different way. God's saying that if I stand on my righteousness, He will allow me to stand on my righteousness. But if I'm willing to listen, to be guided, and to be shown by the Holy Spirit... That's the path to go. Well, why is that? Why is that so important? Um, because my judgment, <laughs> your judgment, um, is based on what you know and understand. And I don't know and understand everything. Only God does that. Verse eleven of judgment, because the ruler of the world is judged. Ouch. So what he's saying is, uh, I'm going to throw that out right here and I'm going to walk over there, okay? What he's saying is, you choose to stand with the world, you stand with the one who is judged. 
you choose to listen to the one who is judged, you too will be judged. Right? Pretty straightforward. Really don't need any discussion about that. The only choice there and the only decision there is who you're going to stand with. Kind of up to you. Not kind of, but a lot up to you. See, the difference here in the decision is in rejecting Jesus, it puts us on the same category or the same level or the same position of those who rulers in this world who be judged. Now, wait a minute, Wayne. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So what you're telling me is those people that I throw the remote at or yell and scream at on the TV, I'm going to be standing with them? You betcha. But I didn't say that. That's what this says. Those people that I despise or can't stand because they won't stand for what's right or what's true, I'm going to be standing with them? Yeah. Those deadbeat people that I don't, I don't really care for that won't take responsibility for their life, I'm going to be standing with them? Yeah. Yeah, I got another. I got a list. You want to see my list? And you wonder why I'm still working on this after 10 years. <laughs> Last thing, verse 12. Sabotage causes schisms, but the Spirit amplifies. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. Now, I, I can appreciate, because if it were me, just think about this, think about the difference here. If I wanted the disciples sitting there, I would be bug-eyed and sweating. And I'm sure Jesus looked at the disciples and said, yeah, we're done. Can't go any further down that road. I could, but I'm not going to. I'd be sitting there just... How do I get my mind around all this stuff? You ever feel that way? I, I feel that way just looking at their circumstances. But, but it says, verse 13, However... When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, and He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said that He will take of mine and declare it to you. Do you know what He's saying there? That He will be the amplifier of what God has in a process of giving it to you. So whatever God has, and you know the Bible tells us He's got all the cattle on a thousand hills. He's got all the resources. Everything in the world, everything that, that is possible to attain, to aspire to, God will provide through the Holy Spirit. So tell me, how important is it to hear the Holy Spirit? Seems paramount. Seems really, really, really important. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the uh, 2000 Republican Convention uh, in July of uh, 2000, they were in Philadelphia. And they had this great big hall, they had a meeting place, and everybody was there. But, but when they began to look through the mechanics of things, they come in and they start this procedure with the ring of the gavel. But they could ring the gavel in such a big hall they couldn't fit, they couldn't they couldn't hear anything. They could bear people talking, you couldn't even heart think nothing to it. So you know what they did? They amplified the hammer drop. And they got it to where it was it was loud enough that it would it would be very clearly heard, but not so overwhelming that it would beat you down. Do you know that's what the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is there to amplify the things in life that God is trying to provide for you, with you, through you, to you, without beating you down, but also without leaving you in the dark, unable to hear. See, the reality is my witness is weak. My ability is weak. My determination sometimes is weak. But Jesus promises here that that the Holy Spirit will be the loudspeaker. Not only, not only that I might hear Him, but that I might proclaim Him to other people. See, I talk to people occasionally that, that they're like, well, I'm scared to witness to somebody because I don't have all the answers. Amplify the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. We give you the words to say, give you the way to say it. 
Oh, I, I don't know about I don't know about comforting somebody. I don't know about I don't know being with somebody when they lose a loved one or they're they're in a tragic situation. Amplify the Holy Spirit. Do you know most of the time it's not about the words, it's about loving on somebody? Sincerely loving somebody? See, we don't make it by, we don't survive by, we don't we don't flourish by our own abilities. Back to that cookie cutter thing. Um, this week, Karen and I had the, the opportunity to be reminded of how life is not cookie cutter. We took off after uh, church last Sunday and went to uh, Colorado and went skiing. Great thing, right? Not a lot of people get that chance. Should be very, 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 very valuable. Um, in the process of that, though, on the way back, um, and there are other things that happened in there that are, that are unique to us also, but the uniqueness began to become even clearer. Um, we're in the Steamboat Springs Airport, and our flight is the only one that's delayed. Not very fair, is it? I mean, why don't all those other people get to be delayed? After an hour or so, hour and a half, we're beginning to contemplate well, we've got to make a connection in Denver. It doesn't look like we're going to make this connection. Hmm. Doesn't seem very fair at all. Well, what happened to that cookie cutter approach? When you sign up for something, it happens the way it's supposed to happen. I paid them money. They were mean to me when I checked in. Everything's normal. Sorry, that was an inside joke. But... So you get there and everything's supposed to flow a particular way. I want you to learn a phrase and you're going to repeat it with me. And we're going to repeat it a couple of times here. I'll read it for you the first time. My life is not cookie cutter. I am uniquely loved by God. Try that with me. My life is not cookie cutter. I am uniquely loved by God. Well, then the day goes on and we get to take off and we land in Denver and, and they announce that as you're still on the plane that anyone that has a connection that's more than 40 minutes, please let the other people off because theirs is less than that. Well, at that point, our plane's already loading. And it was, what, 27 gates or something away? <laughs> anyway, so they're saying those people, well, you know what people do? People are gracious and loving and they got out of the way. No, they didn't. They took their time and they gathered their stuff. And I'm just... Mm. Stand up before the door opens. Oh, man. So I had to repeat to myself. Here we go. My love is not cookie cutter. You're with me. My love is not cookie cutter. And I am uniquely loved by God. So we run through the airport and we're... You know, they have the little escalator things where you can go up and then they have the escalators that are flat and little sidewalk things and you run on those sidewalk things you really make up some ground. You get all the way across there and uh, we get close to the gate and they're holding the gate, holding the plane for us. You ever hear that happening? Not very often. Not very often. Once again, with me, my life was not cookie cutter. I am uniquely loved by God. So we get to the gate, and I'm, I'm running, and I'm trying to play with my phone because I can't find my second ticket. You know, modern technology, I like, and I'm old school, I like a paper ticket. I saw the one pop up that went from Steamboat Springs to, to Denver, and I never paid attention to the one that should have been behind it. I didn't scroll. How could I not scroll? That's what we do in our life. We scroll. I didn't scroll. So I get to the to the to the counter and Karen taps hers and I'm like, man, I'm and the lady let me in. No tickets. That 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 doesn't happen ever. Right? So what do we say? My life is not a cookie cutter. I am uniquely loved by God. So then we get on the plane and we get set. Make our way from Denver to, to Dallas. Land in Dallas. And we're talking and 
this lady asked me, she said, what carousel did they say would be our luggage? And I said, I don't know. I just got a text. They lost mine. I wasn't really paying attention. Technically, they didn't lose it. It didn't make the plane because it didn't run through the airport like we did evidently. So, here we are again. My life is not cookie cutter. I am uniquely loved by God. We go downstairs to the baggage area and tell the little man working there, hey, our luggage is didn't make the flight. He pulls up some information and says, uh, okay, uh, we'll bring it out to you. You know, bring it out to your house. I said, okay. He asked for an address. We give him the address and he said, oh, that's a long way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. And I'm still thinking, yeah, my life's not cookie cutter. I don't live here in town. He says, uh, and, and it was so funny because there's more people over there, but the three of us are standing there and he says, oh, that that's a long way. And neither one of us said anything. And so we're all three standing there silent. And he says, we'll ship it out to you. Okay. Okay. So they're going to ship it out to us and, and, and bring it to us. And so one last time, my life is not cookie cutter. I am loved, uniquely loved by God. So they're going to bring it to us and everything works out, right? But in the midst of that, now that you've heard that one story of one day, that doesn't include the fact that when we get home, the dog ate the recliner that I love. <laughs> well, not that day, but before that. Or, or any of the things that happened in the process of that week that reminded me of my life being unique. See, I think if you took a moment, you could fill in the blank and write your own story of the day of how your life is unique. How your life is unique to you and to you alone. And I think we all need the reminder that we are loved. We are uniquely loved by God. Isn't that true? Isn't that powerful? Isn't that... Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's purpose is about? Father God, I thank You so much that, that You don't leave us or forsake us. That You don't drop us off on the side when things go bad. That Lord, when things are overwhelming, You are there with, with us to wrap Your arms around us, to comfort us, to, to give us strength. That, that when the stresses of a day go completely wrong, we can remember that we are uniquely loved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we walk through this week, we will be observers of what Your Holy Spirit is doing. That we will see Your kingdom work. That we will see things bigger than we've ever seen them. That we will see, that we will see nourishment and comfort. That we will see provision and blessing. That we, will, that, we will see, that we will see love in a new way. And we will give You praise. As we sing to You now, Lord, in Jesus' name.